Welcome to Capitol View, your weekly look at the happenings inside and outside the Illinois State Capitol. I'm your host, Jennifer Fuller. Our guests this week are Capitol News Illinois' Jerry Nowicki and Hannah Meisel. Thank you both for joining us. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having we us, had a lot. Sure thing. We had a lot of news over the last couple of weeks with the end of the General Assembly spring session, the signing of the budget, and there are still things that are happening as Governor J.B. Pritzker is now considering and in some cases signing into law some of the bills that were passed out of the General Assembly. Perhaps the biggest news this week in terms of bills that were signed into law is uh, what many are calling the book ban ban. Uh, Jerry, I will lead off with you. Basically what this does is prevent uh, public school libraries and public libraries from banning books, otherwise they'll lose state funding. Is that right? Right. And it's not necessarily trying to uh, regulate the process of procurement or anything like that. Like you could still, the board could still uh, determine which uh, books uh, they put on their shelves and determine their own criteria. But what it's trying to prevent is taking books that are already on the shelves off of them based on, you know, political pushes or whatever other circumstances um, are are leading to people wanting the book off the shelf. So it's, you know, the board's going to make their decisions as to what books they want to stock. But, you know, if someone has a mob outside saying, get rid of this book, they don't want that to be the case. So they got to adopt a sort of policy that says, um, you know, we're not going to do that. Uh, and that policy is uh, within the uh, optional that they they adopt their own policy or one by the American Library Association's Bill of Rights, which says basically the same extent that we're not going to ban books based on uh, political pushes. And of course, you know, there is a, a side of this where uh, you have some people saying that this uh, walks all over local control, for example, of schools and of public libraries. Hannah, do you expect that this is going to be tested, maybe not in court, but perhaps with boards going ahead and pulling books off the shelves? Yes, I do expect, uh, you know, most things that go through Springfield, especially, you know, big laws like this to be tested um, in this political environment. You know, I'm sure that there are First Amendment lawyers who are readying uh, their cases or trying to recruit library uh, board plaintiffs. Um, but, you know, this is, I guess that's to be expected. And this is uh, this is an initiative of new Secretary of State, Alexei Janulius, who, of course, came in after uh, many, many terms. I think uh, former Secretary of State Jesse White had served in that post since 1998. And uh, Julius is, you know, coming in looking to make his mark. And this certainly uh, is one of those things that both makes his mark on the office, but also, you know, we've known Alexei Junilius, uh for years. Of course, he uh, had been state treasurer in the uh, aughts. And, um, you know, he's still young and he's definitely, I think, looking to raise that national profile um, because, you know, he's got a long career ahead of him. He made his return to politics to run for secretary of state. Uh, you know, so I definitely uh, could see some challenges here and, you know, can see Alexei Julius saying, well, we're going to fight it because this is what's right. Speaking of Alexei Janulius, now his office will have uh, the authority, but also the responsibility of keeping track of how books are either pulled from the shelves, kept on the shelves, these sorts of things. Does the library uh, or the secretary of state and, and the state librarian, which it's one and the same, uh, does the state librarian already have that power to go back in and individually uh, take a closer look at how the grants are distributed to the public libraries? Or is he going to have to reorganize some parts of his office in order to put the teeth into this new law? Hannah, I'll start with you. I'm going to defer to my colleague, Jerry Nowicki, because for a lot of uh, session this spring, I was covering that big ComEd trial. So I'm unfamiliar with the details of this bill. Certainly, and we will, of course, get to that. Jerry, do you think that the Secretary of State is prepared to enforce this law? Um, you know, I have, I, I wouldn't say, I think that the Secretary of State, the grants aren't on autopilot, you know, as they are now. Um, 
there's scrutiny of those grants. There's making sure uh, there are other conditions of them. I don't know what they all are, and I'm not even clear on 100% what the process is, but I think, you know, an added uh, box to check uh, is one thing. You know, it's a fairly simple thing to do to adopt these policies, saying you're not going to do that. Um, I, I think we saw a similar thing with uh, statewide building codes that were up in the General Assembly. Uh, just having passed that law allows Illinois to check a box that uh, when they're applying for federal uh, FEMA dollars in the case of a disaster that do you have statewide building codes? Yes. Um, you know, I think there will still be some scrutiny. I think um, as much of that will come from news media of, of, of book bans that are occurring as, as it would from the um, uh, Secretary of State's office. But, you know, uh, this didn't make Secretary of State the state librarian. It didn't create these grants. So there's there are people who are going over those documents now, and I think there'll just be an added level of scrutiny and an added box to check on those documents when people are when libraries are applying for funding. Absolutely. Stay tuned. Hannah, I want to get back to what you were mentioning before, and that's one of the criticisms that the Republicans had of the spring session in general, and that is that ethics reform really didn't come to the top of the list when uh, new legislation was considered. You, as you mentioned, covered uh, what was called the ComEd 4 uh, bribery trial. You're in the midst of covering another trial involving public corruption. We've all talked in the past about the fact that former House Speaker Michael Madigan is expected to go to trial early next year. So what are Republicans working on? What do you expect to see, perhaps in the veto session, when it comes to ethics reform in the state of Illinois? Well, uh, to your first question, what are Republicans working on? They had um, proposed a variety of legislation that they say would uh, target public corruption. You know, a lot of it is, I think, things that in principle Democrats would agree with, but in practice, some of it could violate, uh, you know, First Amendment uh, issues. And, you know, some of it uh, is just impractical. And, you know, Democrats and Republicans, of course, talk about ethics. and. You know, we live in a state where, of course, our reputation had been marred by corruption scandal after corruption scandal. But let me tell you, after sitting in that courtroom for eight weeks, um, you know, watching every detail of the case, it's to react to a specific public corruption uh, scandal with either overly broad or overly specific uh, you know, proposals on ethics, both miss the mark. Because if you do something overly broad, you're going to, um, you know, raise the, it's going to be much, much more difficult for people to run for office, or, you know, it's going to dissuade certain people, especially people who don't have access to money and connections to run for office. And that's not what you want. You want people to feel free to enter the political arena, whether or not they have that money, whether or not they have those connections. Um, and if you do something overly specific, it changes nothing. I mean, in this case, the ComEd bribery scandal had more to do with Mike Madigan himself, the former House Speaker who had held the post for 36 years, record-breaking uh, you know, time leading any legislative chamber in the nation. It had to do with him and how he specifically built and wielded his power. We don't have that anymore. That doesn't mean that there's not still problems, but it means that, you know, the, the issue here and how he had his relationship with Hamed, that is no longer happening. And sometimes it is better to leave things up to, uh, you know, federal prosecutors. Um, and I feel like in the past, you know, I've now been reporting on Springfield for 10 years. In the past, when I have heard that, I've uh, said, well, that's, you know, maybe that's a cop out. But again, after sitting in that courtroom and listening to every detail of that case, you know, you can't, one of my favorite uh, political phrases is culture eats policy for, for breakfast. And that is 100% true in this case. The culture uh, needs to be rebuilt, but that is not something 
that is going to be done top down. Uh, it's not something that you can necessarily legislate. You can't legislate morals. You just can't. You can't legislate uh, someone's behavior to be more in line with, you know, your idea of morality. Uh, that all being said, however, Democrats uh, did promise, you know, ethics legislation. And I would say that they didn't deliver. They they proposed a few things. Uh, you know, there was a bill that actually didn't uh, go through the entire General Assembly. I believe it uh, passed in one chamber, but it would have prevented uh, folks who've been uh, convicted of public corruption from you know, being able to run for office again. Um, but, you know, we did get a couple more, you know, pieces of ethics legislation. Jerry can speak to the specifics. Um, but, you know, I think this is a Springfield problem where people talk a big game and then they don't deliver. And I think that uh, more than some things, that actually is what um, helps degrade public trust by not delivering. Well, Jerry, let's get a little bit into how you change that culture from the bottom up rather than, as Hannah said, from the top down. And one of the ways that that could happen is through more teeth for the Legislative Inspector General's office. And there is a new Legislative Inspector General, and, and that person, uh, Judge Michael McCuskey, is, is moving from uh, Peoria to the Springfield area in really a, a way to try and keep a closer eye on things and enforce what he's been tasked with enforcing. How important is it to have this position and for that position to have enough teeth that lawmakers think twice before they do something that perhaps would violate a code? Yeah, it's it's a bit of a challenging question to ask because um, a lot, you know, everything we saw in the ComEd trial, everything Hannah's covering now in the um, sort of connected sweepstakes gaming scandal that she's covering in the courtroom, uh, those people are all accused of breaking laws that already exist. And if you're willing to do that, uh, adding more flaws isn't going to stop you from doing that. Um, right. So, I mean, and I, I posed that question to Republicans when they were talking about um, the ethics reforms not going anywhere this year. And they said, we got to do whatever we can uh, to stop them from even approaching the line. And, you know, there are things to do that. Um, but, uh, uh, um, you know, the legislative inspector general, Mc uh, McCuskey, he spoke to our colleague Nika Schoonover, and he said, I, you know, I, I don't think I'm ever going to do a better job investigating public corruption in the Northern District of Illinois or, you know, any other uh, federal offices. Um, he said if, if, if someone brought him a corruption case, and he hasn't had any uh, corruption cases brought to him in one year. So it's, it's, it's not a matter of uh, his authority to investigate him. They just haven't brought him to him. So, um, and even so, if he's, he found something there, he'd uh, send it up to the Northern District of Illinois or wherever else, whatever jurisdiction uh, would be investigating that thing. So he, in the interview with Nika, sort of indicated that he's taken a wait and see approach in terms of requesting greater authority from the General Assembly. A lot of his predecessors have not liked um, the reliance that office has on the Legislative Ethics Commission in terms of whether it can publish a report or not. Um, Hannah, I think, broke the story in 2021 or so when Carol Pope resigned and said this office, uh, she's another former Inspector General, she said this office doesn't have enough authority, authority to investigate. But, you know, McCuskey said he's going he's gonna to wait and see what uh, authority he should request from lawmakers. As with so many things, it's something that we're going to have to just keep track of and, and see how this pans out. Jerry, I want to stay with you, um, uh, and I should let people know that the story you mentioned from Nika Schoonover uh, is available at CapitalNewsIllinois.com, and you can find more at WSIU.org as well. One of the other stories that broke this week was really a follow-up to an investigation through Capital News Illinois' Beth Hunstorfer and Molly Parker of the Lee Enterprises Midwest Bureau and ProPublica, and that took a deep-dive look into allegations of mismanagement and even abuse and neglect at the Choate Mental Health and Rehabilitation Center in far southern Illinois in Union County. Now, as a result of that, lawmakers took a closer look and they passed legislation that would actually make it a little bit um, uh, easier for people investigating to 
punish those who've been accused and, and found guilty of crimes, not necessarily through the courts, uh, but in a more administrative way. Uh, Jerry, do you think that this is where this ends, or will there be more when it comes to what happens at Choate? There has to be more. Um, I mean, we're we're continuing to follow what's going on there now, what's gone on there since we began reporting in September, and what's gone on there since the governor announced um, his quote unquote uh, transformational changes to the facility, because those don't happen overnight. Um, and uh, all of the leadership that oversaw all of these employees that were arrested is still in charge of the facility, which is you know something we're continuing to um, monitor. Um, but I think um, in terms of just the new law that's giving the greater authority is the inspector general uh, of that office, Peter Numer, said he needs this type of authority to act as a deterrent. And what it allows him to do is if there's a finding of um, material obstruction is a new offense uh, created um, that allows uh, the inspector general to forward this person's name who's been uh, found to have uh, committed that offense to a healthcare worker registry that would ban them from uh, ever getting a job in healthcare outright. So people who act to um, stymie an investigation, which is a lot of what we found in the investigation we've done, people who act to stymie those uh, could have their career in healthcare end entirely. Um, blacklisted in the state of Illinois. So, uh, you know, whether that's going to be used a lot, uh, Inspector General Numer said it would be maybe a handful time, handful of times a year. Is it going to be wide ranging? Probably not. Is it going to be a deterrent? Uh, that's the hope of everyone who's gotten on board. And I think that passed unanimously through both chambers. So it was a fairly uncontroversial and common sense uh, reform to get at the root of some of the things we uncovered in our reporting. As you mentioned, Jerry, there is this entire kind of shakeup of how Choate is going to be uh, utilized as a state facility. Some residents are going to be moved out to other places, and that facility will be used in uh, perhaps new and, and different ways. But this isn't the first time that we've talked about a state-run facility for among Illinois' most vulnerable population. We've talked about issues within uh, state veterans' homes when it comes to COVID, when it comes to Legionnaire's disease. How important is it to the state really take a closer look at how it's caring for those vulnerable people and that it holds people accountable if they're put in a position of authority? Well, sure, it's extremely important because Illinois is a bit of an outlier among the 50 states in that it relies far more heavily on large institutions for people with disabilities. You know, there are several factors for that. Uh, a big one is um, unions uh, will fight any real um, changes or downsizing to any facilities. Another is that they're major employers in most of the uh, rural um, areas in which uh, they are located. So the, the locals would fight any changes and it's, it's a hard thing to do. So the governor, you know, he announced his plan, which essentially would be relocating roughly half of Schott's population um, it would relocate the individuals who were there on more of a voluntary basis, whereas it would remain the uh, place where uh, people have been court ordered to go for, um, you know, whatever um, psychiatric or um, help they need in order to uh, become better. Well, the thing is, you know, if it's a dangerous place, uh, even if you've been ordered there by a court, you still have a right to not get the snot kicked out of you by the staff there. So, you know, just because they're announcing these transformational changes doesn't mean it doesn't need the level of scrutiny that's been uh, given to it in recent months either. So um, I, I, I just think, uh, you know, there's the, we're, there's going to, we're going to have to keep watching, not just show, but every single developmental facility in Illinois. And one of the, one thing I will note is that the governor increase the pay for people who serve in uh, uh, serve people with disabilities in community settings, which is an alternative to institutional settings, but also, you know, they're, they're a vulner vulnerable population. So, you know, community settings aren't any panacea of sorts, but, you know, giving them the option to 
live outside of these large institutional facilities is an important thing to do in Illinois as well. Uh, a many-pronged approach, certainly. Uh, Hannah, Governor Pritzker uh, issued a lot of um, ideas, things that he'd like to get done when it comes to uh, the state of Illinois, both in his budget address and then as he toured the state, kind of touting the fact that most of what he wanted was included in the budget. Uh, another thing that he has really pushed is to make sure, as we were just talking about vulnerable populations, that homelessness is addressed. And there are a lot of pieces of the Illinois budget that send funding to homelessness prevention programs and services to help people who find themselves either near homelessness or, or, or homeless themselves. Do you think that the state is an outlier when it comes to how it's doing this? Or is it someplace that people uh, around the nation may come to look at in terms of bringing agencies together? You know, the homelessness is such an intractable problem in the U.S. Um, there's certainly, uh, you know, a lack of federal leadership on this issue, definitely left up to states and, uh, I mean, really big cities to deal with, um, especially. But uh, make no mistake, rural homelessness is a huge problem, too. Uh, and it's just, I would say, underreported on. Um, is Illinois an outlier? I don't think so, but uh, I think that state leaders are hoping that Illinois' approach um, can become um, a national leader after a few years. Um, I want to say in the fall of 2021, there was a series of hearings uh, in the House Housing Committee, um, and I think that um, those member, the panel of lawmakers on that committee heard from leaders in other states. Um, but, you know, I don't think that this is an issue that any state has gotten perfectly. And certainly the pandemic, um, despite, you know, the that is the one federal action that we could point to in recent years, decades, really, uh, the federal moratorium on evictions. Um, you know, despite that, COVID definitely exacerbated this problem. And, you know, for folks, if we remember the first, um, you know, months of the pandemic, that was a time when, um, you know, we were very, very afraid to go near anyone. And so, of course, homeless shelters really, really struggled with how to address this issue because, you know, just like all congregate care uh, living, you know, arrangements, that's a place where COVID could spread more easily. Um, so this Home Illinois uh, initiative, um, this builds on existing uh, homeless prevention programs that Illinois already had in place. But um, you know the budget that begins on July 1st, it, uh, according to this press release from the governor's office I'm going to read from, commits almost $360 million for the initiative, uh, an $85.3 million increase from this current fiscal year. Um, this includes money for uh, shelter and services. Um, this is also, you know, especially in the Chicago land area, but I suspect it's going to um, trickle down to the rest of the state. Um, certainly, you know, if if um, migrants um, who are being shipped from especially Texas, uh, these red states who are trying to, of course, stick it to blue so-called sanctuary cities, um, you know, not tr treating these uh, migrants from Central South America as political pawns and not people. Um, you know, this issue of shelter is critical. And it was, of course, critical uh, before and even more critical now. Um, this also includes $50 million in uh, what's called rapid rehousing services for 2,000 households. You know, this is an issue... Um, where, you know, it, if you get evicted, and if you, you know, there's a lot of sociological researchers who uh, say that, you know, most people, most Americans, or maybe a surprising number of Americans are only a few, you know, medical emergencies, say, or other financial emergencies uh, away from suddenly finding themselves homeless. It is that dire. Uh, so many people live on the bubble. So many people live paycheck to paycheck. Uh, and so, you know, if someone suddenly finds themselves um, 
homeless and we should remind people that homelessness is not just uh the stereotype of folks who are um going from shelter to shelter and living on the streets homelessness is people who are crashing um with friends or relatives couch surfing for extended periods of time because they can't afford a place of their own um homelessness is people living in their cars uh, homelessness is a lot more than the eye can see um you know this also includes um you know 37 million dollar in emergency shelter capital funds to create more than 460 non-congregate shelter units again we have a lack of uh you know shelters we have a lack of housing um this is something that you know cities states all over uh struggle with but you know being you know the fifth nation's fifth largest state um you know having a really big city and having mid-sized cities we're, we're going to struggle it, with it more we'll certainly have to stop things there but that's a big issue and certainly something i'm sure we'll continue to talk about i want to thank jerry nowicki and hannah meisel for joining us this week on capitol view and you can find all of our episodes online at WSIU.org and at our YouTube channel. I'm Jennifer Fuller.